Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 14 I jolt awake, who knows how long later, when the pastor rattles the truck over a dry riverbed. I can't believe I fell asleep when I should have been measuring our distance from the farm and keeping watch. I shake my head and prop myself up so I can see out. The sun's on the other side of the sky when the shadows slope, tells me it's late afternoon and that we're heading southeast. I know that we're way past where Musa or the other bosses would think to look for us, but now I have a new worry, the pastor himself. Soon he's either going to get to his destination or find somewhere to stop. He certainly isn't going to drive forever through the bush after dark. He'll need to eat and rest. I don't know what lies in the Ivory Coast to the south of the farm where we are, but we're moving fast in the wrong direction. For a moment I hesitate, then I shake Khadija awake. She bolts upright, slapping my arm away. Take it easy. It's just me, I say. For a moment, her eyes dart around and all her muscles strain against the thin blue fabric of her dress as she gathers herself to run. Then she takes a shaky breath. Sorry. We need to talk, I say. What's wrong? Well, don't get upset, but I think your idea was a great one and this truck has worked really well for us so far, but I think we need to leave. Khadija considers starting staring out. Now? Soon, at least, before he stops and finds us. I mean, it's really good that he's taking us so far from camp, but we're just going to have to retrace our steps to go north. The farther he takes us south, the more we're going to have to walk to get to where we need to be. If the pastor catches us, we're done for. And if he pulls into a town to get something to eat or to spend the night, then we're even more likely to be seen jumping out. Idly, I rest my hand on Sadu's head. Instantly, I forget about needing to get out the truck. We have a bigger problem. He's burning up, I gasp. Khadija puts her hand on his face, then leans away. Under both of our hands, his eyes open sluggishly, but he looks glazed. If only we hadn't lost the med kit, Khadija mumbles helplessly. Do you have any water left? No, we drank all the water when we were on the trail. I reach into my pocket and pull out the water bottle. Then, because it felt good to get rid of that, I empty out my other pocket as well. Oh, gasps Khadija. I tense and glance around, trying to find the danger. What? Where? But when I look at Khadija, she's not scouting, scouting the woods. She's holding up the two little bottles from the small box that was in my pocket. The med kit. You didn't lose it, she squeals. Woohoo, I say acidly. It's tiny. He's missing an arm. I also have half a box of matches and machete if you're going to get so excited about the stuff I'm carrying. Khadija makes a face, then shakes a pill from each of the two little orange bottles into her hand. She leans forward. Here, take these, she says to Sadu. What are they? I ask as he pushes against me, recoiling from her. One's an antibiotic. The other one is something that should help with the fever and the pain. I don't know if this is the right dose or even if they're expired, but he can't keep fighting off infection without a little help, and it's all we've got. Come on, Sadu, open your mouth. She turns to Sadu. No! His voice is hard to hear because he's buried his face in my shirt. I hold out my hand and Khadija puts the pills into it. You're sure this will help? I ask her over his head. She nods. I look at the little box with a new respect. Should we give him more? No, you don't take pills all at once. It could make things worse. Oh, I say, feeling stupid. Then curious, I ask, how do you know so much about pills? She looks away. I want to be a doctor when I grow up, she admits. I stare at her blankly. Big dreams for a girl. Bigger dreams than anyone I've ever known would dare to dream, boy or girl. I wonder again where exactly she came from to have dreams so big. Sadu pushes his head harder into my chest, reminding me why I'm holding pills in the first place. With my free hand, I turn Sadu's head so that he's looking me in the face. You need to eat these pills, I tell him. His jaw sat stubbornly, but this time I'm not going to give in like I did about the sleeping hut door. This isn't a choice. Take them, I say. It's the same tone of voice I used when I would tell him how to cut pods in a way that wouldn't hurt him. The one I used when I would tell him to take pods out of my sack so that I would get punished instead of him. 
Thedu's eyes darken, but he opens his mouth. Even in the midst of a fever, he knows that tone too. I pop the two pills in. He gags a little, but swallows, then opens wide to show me they're gone. Happy, he grumbles. I ignore his tone and look at Khadijah. Are we happy, doctor? Well, actually, Khadijah says, fingering the roll of gauze from the kit. While we're at it, we should change the bandage, don't you think? That one that's on there now is really dirty. No! Sedu pulls away from me, grabbing his elbow stump to his chest. Leave me alone. This is all your fault anyway. I took your stupid pills. Now just leave me alone. Khadijah looks as though he slapped her. Sedu's face is contorted with pain and anger. Khadijah leans forward, laying her hand on his knee. He pulls it away. I'm sorry, she says. Sorry doesn't bring my arm back. I know, she whispers, but I want you to know that I'm sorry anyway. I didn't know what it would be like here. I had no idea what they would do to you, to Amadou, to all of us when I ran. I never wanted anyone to get hurt. I only wanted to get away. She gives him a watery smile. I'm glad that when I finally did, you got away too, but I'm sorry. I hold my breath and keep out of this conversation. Sedu stares at her. Then finally he mumbles. I guess whoever cut me, it's really his fault. Do you know who did it, Amadou? He looks at me. No, I answer truthfully, glad beyond measure that I never asked. You didn't see who it was? I wasn't paying attention, he admits. I was talking to Yusef, who was working behind me and reaching around a tree in front of me at the same time. Then I just remembered the pain and waking up back at the camp. My happiness at finding out that Yusef wasn't responsible surprises me. You're, bra you're very brave, Sedu, Khadijah whispers, and very fair. Thank you. He glowers at her. I'm still not happy with you for tricking me that first day and making Amadou get beaten, and I still don't want you messing with my arm. I'm kind of on his side for that one. Sedu's shoulder and upper arm are thin, but wiry and strong from working in the fields. Then his elbow, scratched and scabby, but still there. And then nothing beyond that but a few centimeters of filthy bandage peeling at the edges. I don't want to take it off. The last thing I want to do is look at what's left of Sedu's arm. Isn't it good enough that it's covered, I ask, without much hope that she'll agree. Khadijah rolls her eyes, then she turns to Sedu. You probably don't remember, but I was there the day your fever got so high that you thought your eyes were being eaten by yellow spiders, and you screamed for half an hour straight. The reason you got so sick from that first cut was that no one kept it clean. Do you want that to happen again? I feel stupid once more. Sedu's eyes dart between Khadijah and me. His forgiveness of her is still awfully new and raw, and he may not remember much about being sick, but he knows he almost died before. He's not letting it out, but I can almost hear the fear screaming inside him as he remembers Musa cutting off his arm. Let's get you better, Khadijah says softly and touches his good side. This time he doesn't pull away from her. Maybe he remembers more of his day with her than we thought. Okay. His voice is barely a whisper. Swallowing hard to fight the feeling of wanting to vomit, I look at Khadijah again. Let's do it. Khadijah scoots over until she's kneeling facing us. Hold him, just in case. I lock my arms around Sedu's upper body, caging him against me. Khadijah leans forward and picks at the edge of the, of the bandage. Dirt and ash flake off and settle in his lap as she unwinds the gauze. Sedu turns his face into my chest and whimpers. The last layer of gauze lifts off, and I'm left staring at the shiny stump where my brother's arm should be. Oh, no stitches, murmurs Khadijah. I look more closely. She's right. The skin below his elbow is a tight, do domed mound, smeared with something that looks and smells like papaya. But there are no stitches crossing it. How, I start, he must have cauterized it. She's still mumbling, but then she sees the look I'm giving her and catches herself. Um, Musa must have used something to burn the wound shut. The flat side of a machete pulled out of the fire, maybe? 
Sedu nods, not meeting her eyes. The image makes me sick. I can only imagine how much that must have hurt. Khadija is still talking. A good thing, really, because it's kept the wound so clean under all that gauze. I really think it was the stitches before that caused it to fester. I have trouble understanding her happiness. The skin is tight and angry and swollen, and Sadu's arching against me, trying to be brave through the pain as his burned stump is exposed to the air. I have trouble thinking that anything about this is a good thing. Khadija lifts the bandage near her face and sniffs. What is this? she asks. Papaya, I say, glad to finally have something to say that Khadija doesn't know. She looks quizzical. Papaya or banana leaves? That's what you use to wrap burns so that they don't get too dry. I point to the gauze she pulled off, dirt crusting the outside, blood and mashed fruit crusting the inside. That way it doesn't pull the skin off every time you change the dressing. That's what we did at home anyway. Isn't that what you'll learn when you're a doctor? Khadija blinks. I don't know, she says. She goes and looks into the little kit. There's nothing else in here, she tells me, sounding disappointed. I shrug. It was too much to hope that box would solve all our problems. Khadija squints at the bandage we just pulled off. Should we reuse some of the papaya, she asks. I guess for now. Gently, Khadija spreads a little of the mashed papaya over Sadu's stump and then uses some of the fresh gauze to wrap it again. He hisses with a pain but doesn't pull away. Okay, I'm done, she says softly to him once it's wrapped. That's the best we can do for now. You were really brave, she whispers. She rubs his back. Her face is still beaten up, but her expression is gentle behind the swelling. Sadu's not used to having a girl look out for him. Our mother died when he was born, and auntie was pretty strict. And until Khadija, there were never any girls at the farm. He doesn't seem to know what to do with her attention, and hasn't quite let go of being angry at her for betraying him that first day. But I can tell that somewhere deep down inside, he likes her being nice to him. I clear my throat. Well, if that's all we can do for now, we should probably move on. We still need to get off this truck before we're caught and work our way north. Sadu slumps against me again, as if the very thought of moving has exhausted him. Amadou, really? He whines. Can't we stay here just a little while longer? It's not safe, I say, but even I can hear that my voice lacks its earlier force. I don't think it's the best idea for any of us to jump out of a moving truck, do you? Khadija counters. Can we at least wait until he slows? I roll my shoulders stiffly. Small amounts of sleep and a bouncing truck bed haven't made my injuries feel any better. I'm sure the same thing goes for her. I look at Sadu again and decide not to put him through anything else if I can. Okay, let's wait, I say. Not long later, the pasteur finally slows down. I shake both Khadija and Sadu awake. The falling dust will help cover our exit. It's perfect. This is it. Let's go, I say. Khadija grabs the med kit and the empty water bottle, and I reach for Sadu, who's lying against one of the sacks. Come on, Sadu. I pull on his good arm, trying to get him up. No, he says, pulling away from me, still half asleep. No, I don't want to go. We don't have time for this. I shuffle closer to him and try to lock my arm around his chest so I can drag him with us. Sadu, wake up. We have to go now. Stop it. But Sadu thrashes around in my arms. No, I don't want to. His voice is rising in pitch, whining loudly. I'm glad the noise of the clunky, clunky old engine covers us. But even so, he's endangering us with, with his shouting. Even with Khadija's pills in him, he's still hot to the touch, though not as hot as he was earlier. Shh, I whisper desperately, but it's no good. Sadu's screaming now. I want my arm back. It's not fair. It hurts. Behind me, I hear a quiet whisper from Khadija. Too late. I look out and see that the narrow path we were on that ran past rambling farms and thickets of untamed bush has turned into a real road and opened into the square of a town. I duck reflexively. Sadu struggles out of my grip and snuggles against the snacks, the sacks. I glare at him, angry that he made us lose our opportunity to get out unnoticed. 
Khadija crouches beside me. I risk peeking over the top of the tailgate. Across a dusty stretch, I see a few houses. There's a baby and a dog lying on the ground together, and people are moving around the village now that the heat of the day is past. I hide again, flattening myself on the floor of the truck, hoping none of them saw me. The truck shudders to a stop beneath us. I put my face close to Khadija's ear and whisper, We'll have to wait until it gets dark, and then we'll make a break for the bush when we see the street clear. Khadija makes a face. I don't want to go into the bush in the dark. I stare at her, not believing what I'm hearing. I mean, why not sleep here and wait until early morning? Why take the chance of getting eaten by something in the dark when we could stay here safe in the truck and then head out when it's light? I don't say anything. In principle, of course, I agree with her. It's not a great idea to head into La Brosse in the dark. And of course, I'd rather not do it. But it doesn't even seem like she's processing that it's much more dangerous to stay here. And it's not like we could make it home to Molly in a day anyway. If she was so upset about sleeping in the bush, she should have let us jump out earlier so that we didn't have to travel as far. I'm just opening my mouth to say something to her. And a new voice chimes in. Hello, children. Khadija and I whip our heads toward the voice, and there, leaning his crossed arms on the tailgate of the truck, is the Pasteur.